Samuel Eto completed his move to Mallorca, first on loan from Real Madrid, before heading to AFCON to help his country. Cameroon found themselves in a tough group as AFCON 2000 began. They had to contend with co-host Ghana, Cote d'Ivoire and Togo. In their first game against Ghana, they took the lead early through Mark Vivian Foe, but Kwame Ayu, brother of the more famous Abedi, equalized in the second half. Samuel Eto came off the bench in the 80th minute for Patrick Mboma, making his first ever AFCON appearance and beginning to write his AFCON story. In the next game against Drogba Les Côte d'Ivoire, Eto made his first ever start at an international tournament. And on the stroke of halftime, he scored his first ever goal for Cameroon, their second of the game. It was a brilliant finish, the type that became his trademark, after a square ball by Laurent left him one-on-one -on -one with the goalkeeper. It was perhaps poetic that it was this opponent again, Drogba's country, the country he had scored two against as a junior, which had opened the doors to a European move previously. There just seemed to be something about Eto and Côte d'Ivoire. Cameroon went on to win 3-0, with Eto taking off at halftime. He missed the final group game, which they lost to Togo. The knockouts were here, and this was the stage in which the inimitable Eto shone like a million stars and fully arrived, causing the world to take notice. Algeria were their first opponents in the quarterfinals. Eto started this one and made his noise within 10 minutes. A throw from the right by Jeremy Njitab, who like Eto was playing for Real Madrid at the time, fell to Mboma who touched it forward for Eto to smash into the net. The striker showed great instincts to give Cameroon the lead and register his first ever knockout goal. Another by Foe ensured that they made it to the semi-final, where they would face a tough Tunisia side. The game was a tight nervy affair with both sides unable to score in the first half. Tunisia were the better side through the half, consistently battering the Cameroonian defence although Mboma had the best chance of the half. But things changed quickly early in the second half when Cameroon took the lead. Tunisia struggled to deal with a long throw by Wome and the ball fell kindly to Mboma who made no mistake. As the tensions rose, with Tunisia searching frantically for the equaliser, Cameroon held their nerve until Eto popped up to settle things. Racing onto a through ball from Mboma, he hit the back of the net with a delightful chip over the keeper, effectively sending Cameroon through to the final. If there had been any doubts before, all were dispelled now. A star was truly born, one who would carry Cameroon on his back for years to come. They found a third goal through Mboma again before the game was over. Of course, they were in the final. Then came the big one, the final of Africa's biggest showcase. Eto, playing in his first ever tournament, had scored three goals in four games so far. In the game he failed to score in, he had only played 10 minutes. There was no doubt about his quality now, and many were prepared to forgive him if he didn't turn up in the final like he had done before it. After all, this was a high-pressure game against the co-host Nigeria, who would be playing in front of their fans. Whatever happened in the final, Eto had already done enough to be remembered and elevated to a certain level, and to raise eyebrows all over the world. But this occasion suited Eto. The pressure was not on him. He was still just an 18-year-old with very little experience. It was the older guys in the team who would play with pressure, the likes of Patrick Mboma, Raymond Kala, and Rigobert Song. The game began with Cameroon having the upper hand, completely dominating. The Nigerians struggled to find their feet as Cameroon imposed themselves. And in the 25th minute, the Cameroonians won a free kick deep in the Nigerian half after a throw a Yenemi foul. Pierre Wome took it, playing a low cross into the box, which Eto latched onto before slotting past the Keshorumu in goal for Nigeria to give Cameroon the lead. If anyone wondered if Eto could handle the pressure of such a big final, he had answered emphatically. He was unfazed, and this was the kind of game he lived for. In just his debut tournament, he had scored in the quarterfinal, scored in the semi-final, and now the final as an 18-year-old. So much had changed in just a few years, from hiding in France undocumented and getting rejected at every trial, to signing with the biggest club in the world, 
and scoring in an AFCON final for his country at just 18. What a journey it had been. But he was not even done yet. Just three minutes later, the Nigerians would experience some more Eto magic. He picked up the ball close to the halfway line and went on a run deep into the Nigerian half before slipping a through ball to Mboma while surrounded by four Nigerian players. His strike partner made no mistake, striking between Shorumu's legs. 2-0 it was, and the undisputed star of the show was the 18-year-old. The Nigerians had no answer for him and were scrambling to contain him. Before halftime, the lead was halved and the Nigerians then equalized early in the second half through JJ Okocha. Around the 72nd minute, as the battle intensified, Eto was sobbed off. Cameroon would go on to win on penalties and Eto became an African champion at the first time of asking. He had not merely been a spectator carried along due to age, but rather a major reason for their triumph. This was just the beginning. The Olympics would happen that summer and Eto would show up there too. Didier Drogba, meanwhile, welcomed the birth of his son, Isaac, at the end of the year. It was a major turning point for him, giving him renewed vigor to go at his dreams and try to succeed despite the setbacks. He had gotten injured during preseason in the summer, missing the first four months of the season. During his time out, a lot happened. Mark Westerlope, the manager who had brought him to the club and shown faith despite his injury and physicality problems, had been replaced by Thierry Goudet. Westerlope was the reason Le Mans had patience with Drogba, and that patience never ran dry, with a man who he calls the spiritual father, staunchly backing him despite all the setbacks. With Westerlope now gone, things would take a different turn. It wasn't helped by his absence giving his competition, Daniel Cousin, enough time to secure his spot. Cousin had actually failed to score a league goal for months in Drogba's absence, only to start pumping them in, in the two weeks leading up to Drogba's return. He had scored three times in two games and then scored a brace again in the game that saw Drogba take to the field again. He didn't score in the league again until March, but he had done enough to convince Goudet to go with him in the center rather than Didier, who was now moved to the wings. Drogba got to play only 417 minutes in the 2000-2001 season, scoring his only goal of the season in a Coupe de France third round game against Ajaxio. Having already missed the first four months of the season, he missed the final month as well, as Le Mans labored to a lowly league position in the second division. It was a forgettable season in which his progression stalled, and he ended up out of position, but things were to change the next season. It was a season in which he scored in just four games before January, but somehow ended up in a higher division, the top division in France. Drogba's time on the pitch was very limited starting only 8 games by January and playing less than 20 minutes in 8 of the 13 games in which he was substituted onto the pitch. Despite still managing to score 5 goals in those circumstances, it was clear that Goudet did not rely on him and the club's faith in him was starting to fade. When the January window opened, top division club Gungam, who had been interested in him years prior, were looking for a striker. They had been left short by the departure of Fabrice Fioris to PSG and an injury to French World Cup winner. Stefan Givac, which ultimately ended his career. They reignited their interest in Drogba, a decision that proved ultimately beneficial to both parties. Drogba took the offer and left Le Mans to play in the French top flight. He was two months away from 24 at this point, about to play in a top division for the first time in his career. His debut came on the 30th of January 2002, a way at Gungum's relegation rivals Metz. Drogba started in a three-man attack that also had Florian Malouda and Hakim Sachi. Within six minutes, they were down. Geoffrey Toye had given Mets the lead, which they held till halftime. But as the second half began, the man Didier finally announced himself to top flight football with a goal, the equalizer. Gongan would go on to win the game 4-2, which ultimately proved decisive in keeping them up as they finished just two points ahead of Mets, who got relegated. Despite the great start to his league on career, Drogba didn't find the net again for six matches, but his manager, Guy Lacombe, kept faith with his new signing. In the final four games of the season, however, Drogba scored twice, even though both games ended as losses. The season ended with him having three goals in 11 games. Although these numbers didn't show much, they gave a little hint that he belonged at this level for anyone who was really paying attention. Cote d'Ivoire were paying attention and reached out to him about playing for them that summer. And in September 2002, 
Didier finally made his debut for his country, playing 90 minutes against South Africa. His national team adventure had finally begun. Guy Lacombe was replaced at the end of the season by Bertrand Marchand, and this was to be a significant change in Drogba's career. Marchand had himself been a fan of Drogba while he was at Rhone managing their reserves the previous year, so he got to see lower division teams a lot. He had spotted Drogba and couldn't understand why he did not play more often. He had unsuccessfully tried to convince Rhone to sign him actually. There was something he had seen, a sleeping giant. He would finally get to work with a young striker who, while clearly flawed and far from the finished article, had shown flashes that interested Marchand. He was even one of the people who advised Gongon to sign Drogba months before he was hired as their new coach. Drogba started the season on the bench in a home game against champions Lyon. With Gongon 3-1 down, Marchand subbed him in in the 69th minute. He provided a late assist and goal to force a draw for his team. And in their next game against Ajaxio, he scored again to help his team to a 2-0 win. It looks like he was on course for a great season, but the scoring momentum swiftly evaporated. After going five games without a goal, he got injured, missing a month of action. It was a blessing in disguise. It was during this time out that Marchand and his coaching team finally decided to address the glaring weakness in Jogba's game, the same weakness that had led to all his prior injuries and held him back so much on the pitch. Westerlopo once said of him, Unlike most footballers, Didier has missed out on the academy system. He only started playing every day when he was 18. At Le Mans, it took Didier four years to be capable of training every day and playing every week. I could see he had lived through some difficult times and his family situation was complicated. He lived with his uncle, then with his parents. At Le Mans, it took him a while to digest all that. Even later on, a lot of clubs questioned how good he was. Gongong sent him to the island of Brerat in Côte d'Amour, setting up training geared towards improving him physically. One of his major struggles was with endurance. He struggled to complete full games and it was a major concern. His posture also made him susceptible to injuries and he was physically weak. These and more were the things this special training was intended to fix. They made Drogba jog for miles on the island, on and on and on. Jogba had to endure the physical torture of the task, sometimes venting his frustrations about how he was here for football and not the marathon. But he soon got to understand the importance of the rigorous physical training he was being put through. As Westerlopo once remarked, Didier is very intelligent. When you tell him something, he often reacts against it at first, but then he thinks it over. He is very ambitious. By the time this training was done and Drogba was set to return to action, he was a man reborn. This version of Drogba would take the world by storm and run through everything in sight on his way to becoming one of the smartest, greatest and most physically dominant strikers the world has ever seen. Samuel Eto'o on his part was on a different island of his own, making headlines and attracting glances. After his January move to Mallorca on the Balearic Islands in January 2000, he returned from AFCON with a mission, brimming with confidence. His first six months were so good that Mallorca bought 50% of his rights, convinced they had found a diamond. They were right. In the 2000-2001 season, he would play a major role firing them into the Champions League, scoring double-figure goals and ending the season as their top scorer. They finished third, only behind Deportivo La Coruña and Real Madrid. But before the start of that iconic season, he had helped his country to Olympic gold in Sydney. Despite not scoring all tournament, he showed that he was the man to rely on in big finals, scoring their second goal to equalize after they had gone 2-0 down. He also scored in the shootout as Cameron matched Nigeria's legendary feat at Atlanta in 1996 to become the second African country to win gold in the Olympic men's football event. And in 2001, while Drogba was enduring what was possibly his worst season in football, in France's second division, Eto hit a major milestone, scoring his first ever Champions League goal. It would be the first of many in a competition that he would later make his own, but he too would end up enduring a difficult season. He scored only six league goals as Mallorca finished 16th, going through three different coaches. For these two, the 2002-2003 season 
was pivotal to their careers for different reasons. And it was during that season that they met for the first time ever. This was where their rivalry truly began. The Genesis. <laughs> 